The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10339 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for today and tomorrow. I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10339. Formally moved. Thank you. And no one's asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 10339 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the next item of business is topical questions. And we start with question number one from Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to UCAS recording a fall in university applications by 18-year-olds from the most deprived areas. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. UCAS figures published yesterday show that the number of applicants of all ages from our most deprived communities, and particularly those in their 20s, are actually increasing, and this is welcome. However, we have also seen a small decrease of around 70 applicants from those who are aged 18, and that is, of course, a concern. In 2017, we saw a 13% increase in the number of people from the most deprived communities getting places to study at university. And if we are to see a similar increase in 2018, there is clearly much more work to do. The Commission on Winding Access made a clear recommendation for universities to try and maximise applications from disadvantaged learners by promoting access thresholds to pupils, parents and teachers. Universities must do all that they can to make learners aware where there are still opportunities to apply before the 30th of June deadline. Ian Gray. It is indeed the case that the modest progress which has been made on closing this gap uh, makes it all the more important uh, that we uh, examine the reasons why that progress appears to have stalled. The Widening Access Commissioner uh, uh, late last year in his report pointed out that not only are students from more deprived areas less likely to apply, they're also less likely to be accepted and less likely to complete the course. So we should be concerned indeed. One factor Sir Peter identifies uh, is support for living while studying. Uh, will the Minister not agree that a worthwhile response to these figures would be to restore the cuts to grants our government made in 2013? Minister. Well, Mr Gray is absolutely correct to point to the um, Commissioner's um, concern around not just who gets into university, but who completes. Um, that's something which I've made clear to university principals and indeed to college principals um, since I um, be became Minister. And it's something which we are intensifying through our outcome agreements with the universities. So when they are looking at this and making good, good progress, we will encourage them to do so. And when we believe we need to pick up the pace of change, not just on widening access for applications and entrance, but also completion rates, we will do so through the outcome agreement process. Um, the Commissioner did point to a variety of uh, different issues which may impact on application entrances and completion rates, student support being one of them. Um, as he knows, the Government has recently increased the income threshold uh, from £17,000 to £19,000, ensuring that an extra 3,000 students get a non-repayable bursary. Um, and we will increase the payment threshold and reduce the payment period for um, loans. Uh, the Government has taken action and will continue to take action to ensure we support the poorest students at university. Ian Gray. I think the Government and the Minister do know that student support matters in this, that it is one of the factors uh, uh, driving the, the gap in applications. Uh, uh, if they didn't, then why would they have uh, commissioned the independent review into student support, which they did? But that review reported uh, with some modest proposals to improve the circumstance for students in both HE and FE back in November. Can the Minister please tell us when the Government will respond uh, and in due course is not a good enough answer? Minister. Well, the Government will respond in due course um, to the uh, review. And that's because uh, I would disagree entirely with Mr Gray when he talks about the modest proposals. Uh, as I said to him in this chamber uh, last week, what the review is asking us to look at in particular is an entitlement benefit for further education students. That has an implication for their ability to access social security. And as I said to him last week, we may very much get into the, the situation where the government makes a rushed decision to ensure an entitlement uh, to um, make changes to FE um, bursaries 
and then see the DWP going on, go, coming along and saying, that's great, thanks very much, and we will now take that money off the benefits from Social Security. So we are continuing to ensure that we discuss our progress on this with the National Union of Students. We are ensuring that we are discussing uh, progress with the DWP to uh, see how the interaction between what the uh, review has asked us to do and what the social security benefit system will do. But I will not take that uh, for the sake of an easy headline if actually at the end of the day we would see students losing out. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday I met with the principal of Maxwellton High School in Dumfries and she told me that students from less privileged backgrounds often take time out of education before going on to university. For example, one student took a year out before enrolling into UWS for mental health nurse training. So she's now attending university, but the numbers don't recognise that. Does the Minister agree that there are different routes for young people into higher education and that the, and that the figures quoted do not take account of that? Minister. Well, it is very important that we bear in mind um, the different ways that people can get into university and indeed to higher education at our colleges. It is very, very important to recognise that it may not be the right um, track for a young person to leave school and directly go into university. And we should respect them and allow them the flexibility in the system to make that decision if it's right for them. That's entirely the point of us looking at this through the prism of what's right for the learner and not necessarily what's right for the statistics or indeed for institutions. So it's an approach that we do intend to continue to encourage. The figures from UCAS actually suggest that more people of all ages are applying to go to university. The number of Scottish domiciled applicants aged 21 to 24 has increased by 4% and the number aged 25 and over has increased by 7%. And I think that's welcome news. Liz Smith. of the uh, Education Committee that there are issues about careers guidance in school and that the real focus if we're going to improve this situation is to talk to youngsters who are perhaps much younger than the university application age. Does the Minister agree that much more work has to be done about that careers guidance and to ensure that there is not the patchy advice that we've had and that the evidence shows from our committee? Minister. Well, Liz Smith is, is um, very um, correct to point to the work that we need to do long before we get to the, um, a young person sitting with an application form. Um, this is about encouraging young people to decide what's right for them, um, to recognise that success for that young person may be an apprenticeship, it may be going to college, it may be going to university. It's about what they want to achieve and the best way for them to achieve that. An important aspect of that is careers guidance, um, and there is a great deal of work um, continuing to ensure that we are getting better careers guidance out there, that we're getting the message out not just to the young people but to teachers um, and to the parents, anyone who, who has an, an influence on those decisions about the parity of esteem that we should hold for the different opportunities that are available to our young people, university being a very important one of them. And Julian Martin. President officer, can the Minister advise how the numbers applying to the Scottish higher education institutions compared to the number of applicants in the rest of the UK and does the increase in non-EU international applicants have an impact on the places available for uh, students applying from Scotland? Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, all applicants to Scottish higher education institutions have increased by 1% to 114,160, and that includes a 13% increase in non-EU international applicants. I think it is something that we can be exceptionally um, proud of as a country, and our universities should take great pride in the fact that we have seen an increase in numbers from non EU international applicants. Uh, the numbers um, for uh, non-EU international applicants uh, do not have any impact on the number of places that are available for uh, Scottish students, both the Scottish domiciled students, those from the rest of the UK, from the EU, and the international students all play an equally pivotal role in making our campuses the proud, diverse campuses that they are today. Thank you very much. We move to question two. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President Officer, perhaps to declare an interest as convener of the Cross-Party Group on Animal Welfare to ask the Scottish Government for what reason it does not support a ban on the export of live animals. 
Cabinet Secretary, Fergus <coughs> uh, Presenting officer, the Scottish Government is committed to the welfare of all animals during transport, whether within the UK or for export purposes. Animals should only be exported in line with strict welfare standards, ensuring freedom from harm and sufficient rest and nourishment to ensure that transport welfare rules are fully complied with. The current EU regulations and standards provide the rigorous framework to protect and promote the welfare of animals. These have been adopted into our law through the Welfare of Animals Transport Regulations 2006. <laughs> we have been clear since the outcome of the EU referendum that we wish to maintain adherence to current EU standards and regulations, particularly regulations on animal and plant health and food safety, because these remain essential for our reputation and also to access EU and other international markets. We will not therefore support any move which creates further challenges or difficulty for our livestock sector or which places Scottish agriculture at a disadvantage. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Can I refer the Cabinet Secretary to an answer 10 years ago, albeit? Uh, SVW 08022 by Richard Lockhead, and I quote, we would prefer to see a trade in meat rather than live export. This avoids long distance travel of live animals whilst ensuring better returns across the industry from added value product. Can the Cabinet Secretary and why, why he thinks better returns uh, uh, for the industry are secured by live exports, which seems to depart from what his predecessor said, quite apart from the not insignificant matter of animal welfare? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't agree with that. Um, I do agree with Richard Lockhead uh, when he uh, made comments to the effect that live animal, el animal exports for breeding are vital for pedigree livestock sector, and when he expressed the sentiment that ideally we would want animals to be killed as close to their farm of origin as is possible. Uh, uh, and of course, the important thing, presenting officer, which I wish, wish to stress, <coughs> is that the animal welfare is paramount, and that the rules and regulations cover very detailed provisions in order to secure that objective. And they do so by making provision for nourishment, making provision for rest, making provision for hydration, and these must be strictly complied with and that is the approach that the Scottish Government believes uh, should be taken. And it's also one, I believe, which is supported by the NFUS and other key stakeholders in the sector. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Oh, I think uh, some of the issues about animal welfare and these long transportations will be disputed and is disputed by many welfare organisations. Can I ask at the very least that the Cabinet Secretary reconsider, just reconsider a consultation on banning live exports because we're exiting the EU, will not be tied to the regulations because I have to say to the Cabinet Secretary, I'd hate by default to become a fan of Michael Gove. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm not really res responsible for whose fan clubs the member is in, but I am responsible for agriculture, and I can absolutely assure the member that these matters are taken with the utmost seriousness. Uh, the position down south is very confused. Uh, there is talk about a ban uh, of live exports for slaughter, but there is no talk about, uh, and, and actually there are very few or no animals that are exported for slaughter from Scotland. Uh, the export of live animals from Scotland is carried out for other reasons, for breeding and production. Uh, and the HMRC have indicated that the value of this totals £50 million a year. So unless one takes the view that that £50 million should be reduced to zero overnight, uh, then I think it would be better to concentrate on ensuring that we all uh, support the, uh, the high standards of animal welfare, which are required by the regulations, and rightly so. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, can I declare an interest as an honorary member of the British Veterinary Association? What evidence does the Cabinet Secretary actually have that a UK-wide ban on live animal exports would damage the livestock sector, specifically in Scotland? And does this now mean that the Cabinet Secretary will be opposing the ban on the export of live animals from other UK countries, effectively the Scottish Government leading a race to the bottom in animal welfare standards? Cabinet Secretary. No, that's uh, complete nonsense. Uh, the proposals from Westminster are, first of all, not clear. 
However, I understand the manifesto commitment of the Conservative Party was to restrict the ban to those animals that are exported for the purposes of slaughter. Uh, we have taken the view, and I think the vast majority of members would take the view, that most animals should be slaughtered as close to the farm as possible. That is why it is so important that we continue to see our abattoirs functioning properly. And of course, 95% of the OVs who work in our abattoirs are EU nationals. And therefore, the greatest practical matter, which she should be considering at the moment, is to ensure that those EU nationals, many of whom from Spain who come to work in Scotland, are able to continue to staff the abattoirs. Otherwise, the practical problems of ensuring slaughter of animals, if Mr. Ruskell cares to listen rather than chatter incessantly behind me, uh, the abattoirs will continue to be available locally, provided there are people from the EU who are working there are able to stay there to ca carry on their good work. Uh, so uh, uh, I would emphasize to Mr. Ruskell uh, that uh, we are all concerned with animal welfare and the considerations about that remain paramount in uh, consideration of these matters. Mike Grumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Mr. Gove is reported as wanting to see a ban on uh, the export of live animals from UK ports. What, on a very practical question, what, if that occurs, if that went ahead, what are the practical implications for exports from Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. The, well, it, it, the question is, what is he proposing? And I'm afraid I'm not clear. I, I, I don't know if Mr. Rumbles is clear what is in Mr. Gove's mind, but I'm not, and that's because he hasn't set it out clearly. However, the manifesto commitment was restricted to a ban for the purposes of slaughter no animals, as I understand it, are currently exported uh, to, other to other member states uh, for the purposes of slaughter, and therefore the impact of that would be, at the moment, zero. The impacts would result if the ban were to extend to export for the other purposes, namely pedigree or breeding or production. Uh, and those impacts would be felt by the poultry sector in particular, by pigs uh, and other livestock. Uh, and the value of this to Scotland has been estimated by the HMRC in 2015 as £50 million. So if those figures are accurate, and I haven't had time to study them, quite frankly, because this is a topical question that was raised just yesterday, if those figures are accurate, then the answer to Mr Rumble's question is that there would be a very, very considerable impact on farmers, on farming, and especially, I think, in the islands of Scotland, where... Uh, by very nature, transportation of animals, albeit intrastate, uh, is a fact of life and is necessary. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. We'll move on now to a debate on motion.